welcome to this event uh, titled Refugee Tales, uh, which is uh, part of RIECA 2020. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Rob Page. I'm the editor of uh, Comma Press, uh, and I'm here uh, today joined by Dave, uh, uh, poet and writer David Hurd, uh, campaigner uh, and activist Anna Pincus, and uh, novelist uh, Marina Lewitschka. Uh, I'm very, uh, very happy to be able to uh, bring these uh, three fantastic guests to, to you in Rijeka in Croatia and to a European audience because most of the events that we've done around refugee tales have been uh, just within the UK because it sometimes feel like, feels like it's a, a very UK centred uh, topic, but obviously it's something which is a, uh, the, the plight of refugees and the way we respond to that uh, is something which affects all of Europe and uh, all of the world. Um, when once uh, basic human rights were understood as to apply to all people, increasingly there's a division between the rights of those with, quote, citizenship in a particular country and those without. In the UK, unlike anywhere else in Europe, people can be held indefinitely in detention centres under immigration law if their, quote, citizen citizenship is in question. Uh, Refugee Tales, uh, the organisers of this fantastic project, which has now brought out three editions, uh, uh, of this book, which Comma Press publishes, um, is a campaign uh, that, that has uh, brought together charities, writers and refugees to change the conversation and the law around refugees here in Britain. Uh, uh, today we're, we're very, very lucky to have the two uh, originators of this project, uh, Anna Pincus and, and David Hurd, um, as, as well as uh, one, of the, one of the writers uh, they invited. Um, I'm going to I'm going to just introduce everybody very very briefly, and then uh, I'll go I'll stop by asking Anna about the project. Uh, just to go through people's introductions, uh, David Hurd is a poet, critic, and teacher. His collections include his collections of poetry include All Just, Out With, and Through, and his recent writings on the politics of human movement have, have appeared in Los Angeles Re Review of Books, Parallax, and Almost Island. He is professor of modern literature at the University of Kent and has worked with Kent Refugee Help since 2009 and is, as I say, one of the coordinators of Refugee Tales. Anna Pincus is the founder and coordinator of Refugee Tales and director of Gatwick Detainees Welfare Group, one of the core ch uh, charities behind this project, uh, for whom she has worked uh, for over a decade, uh, supporting people held in immigration detention and uh, the volunteers who visit them every week. Uh, managing outreach work and raising awareness about the campaign uh, to end indefinite detention. Um, and finally, we have Marina Lewitschka, uh, who was born of Ukrainian parents in a refugee camp herself in Kiel, Germany, uh, after World War II. Um, her first novel, A Short History of Tractors in Ukraine, was published when she was 58 years old and went on to sell uh, a million copies in 35 different languages. Uh, it was shortlisted for the 2005 Orange Prize for Fiction, longlisted for the Man Booker, and won the 2005 Saga Award for Wit and the 2005 Bollinger Everyman uh, Woodhouse Prize for Comic Fiction. The novel since include uh, two caravans shortlisted for the George Orwell Prize, We Are All Made of Glue, uh, Various Pets Alive and Dead, and the, the Betkin Legacy. Welcome, everybody. Thank you ever so much for being here today. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start, uh, Anna, by asking you to tell us a little bit of... That's uh, not uh, so cool. Okay, if you can mute yourself, that's great. Um, I'm going to start, Anna, by asking you uh, to talk about the origins of, uh, of the project and also Gatwick Detainee Welfare Group, which is uh, the charity, uh, the kind of main charity behind this project, not the only one, um, and where, where, this, the, where this idea and also your work comes from. Okay, so um, Refugee Tales is rooted in the work of Gatwick Detainees Welfare Group, um, which is a charity that's been around for 25 years, supporting people in immigration detention at Gatwick Airport. So the volunteers with the group uh, befriend people who are held in immigration detention. There are about 700 people usually detained in two centres at Gatwick at any one time. Um, and the buildings that they're held in are, are prison-like buildings. But the people who are held there have, are not there because they've committed a crime. They're there in, as an administrative convenience. There's no judicial oversight um, for their detention and they're held indefinitely. 
So if you're imprisoned in the UK, you know the end of your time of incarceration. But if you're detained, you have no idea how long you will be kept in detention. So in prison, you count down the days to the end of your sentence. But in detention, you count up the days and it's counting up the days to an uncertain future. And that has a terrible impact upon the mental health of people detained. And people are detained for days, weeks, months. The longest we know someone to have been detained is nine years. So in this context of this um, quite hostile architecture of detention, visiting people becomes quite a radical act. Um, and our visitors do amazing work supporting people in the most difficult times, but offering um, a kind of unconditional hand of friendship um, and acceptance but they heard people in the visits room saying repeatedly to them that they felt invisible, that they wanted people to know their stories, but they didn't feel safe to share their tales in the first person. So refugee tales developed um, as a response to that. And we took the model of the Canterbury tales as a model of journeying and sharing tales. Um, and we connected people after detention with wonderful writers who amplified our voice and who wrote the tales of people that they'd met. And as the project progressed, people also grew in confidence and some of the original people we work with um, managed to obtain status and felt safe to share in the first person. So that the third volume of tales includes tales by well-known writers, but also tales by people with lived experience of detention. And we go on these long walks. So once a year in the summer, we go on a long walk and every evening of the walk, the tales are shared um, in whatever village or, or town we, we've, we've arrived at. The tales are then published. And as Ra said, we've got three volumes of tales and the books are used as tools for people with lived experience to have conversations with parliamentarians and people of influence about the issues. So they're not trapped in a victim narrative, they're actually using their experience with refugee tales to then engage people of influence um, on the issues. And as well as presenting the stories in the three books, um, we have a website, 28 Tales for 28 Days, because the sector that, that we're in calls for a time limit of 28 days for detention to end the uncertainty of length of incarceration. Um, and on that website, you can you can watch um, the writers and actors reading the tales. Um, so that's a that's a really good place to go to to find out what refugee tales is. Is that a, a kind thank of you, thank you, Anna? That, yeah, that's fantastic. So, mm. Marina, when um, Anna first contacted you, or Anna and David first contacted you, why? Uh, what was your response, uh, and why did you say yes? And and also, uh, how how was it? Um, meeting the, the sort of challenge and responsibility of meeting somebody whose, whose life has been kind of changed by this it, it, and uh, and how did you kind of uh, cope with that kind of pressure uh, of that responsibility? To well, at first I was a bit hesitant because I thought my experience was so different but actually the person that Anna put me in touch with told me about <clears throat> the repeated arrests she'd had during her childhood and so my story is told from the child's point of view. And I felt, recently I felt, I felt so angry with our Home Secretary because she wants to incarcerate um, either on an abandoned island or on a ship or somewhere far, far offshore anyway. She wants to incarcerate refugees. And I'm very aware from the tale I told that children above all suffer from that kind of uncertainty and I felt so strongly about it so although my speech is a bit impaired with cerebellar ataxia I still wanted to come on and talk about the position of children who are being punished through no fault of their own and often through something that they don't even understand and that they're being held in detention nevertheless your, your story, The Dependence Tale, uh, is, is told from a, a young girl's point of view. Yes, it is, uh, yes. Because actually, 
she had uh, all the experiences when she was eight years old. So she's grown up now. And it, and it tells the story of uh, somebody who's continually woken in the middle of the night by large, burly security officers who are not police, who are not army. Turns out they are uh, privately contracted security. Yes, it's uh, horrible, actually. And, and it's, a, it's a cycle. She goes through a cycle of being ripped from her bed in the middle of the night, taken to a detention centre, uh, going through the process or the, uh, the threat of being returned to her original country, uh, then uh, being released, and then the whole process going on again and again and again. And although in, in her case, it's a story of, uh, it's a story which in, in which eventually her kind of asylum status is resolved, it ends very powerfully the story by saying, you know, this, you could see this as a, as a happy ending, as a happy story, but her childhood has been lost in the process. Yes. Her entire childhood has been unnecessarily uh, destroyed through this, this, this trauma of continually being woken in the middle of the night, uh, sent to effectively a prison, um, and then spending months and months and months not knowing if, if she'll ever be released and then the cycle being, um, being repeated. It's, as you say, it's very, very, very different from your own experience. Um, it is different because I was, I put, well, the, my mother was pregnant with me when she was put on the train. From, from the Ukraine to Germany? Yes. So and, it was quite different, but it was awful as well. Sure. Um, and then you were, you were born in a, in a refugee camp or a displaced... I was born in a place called the Rakhansi, which no longer, I think, no longer exists. A park has been put there and a memorial to people. It wasn't a concentration camp and it wasn't a refugee camp. It was a sort of um, displaced persons camp because at the end of the Second World War, there were people moving around all over Europe who, like me, were displaced. And now I see the same thing happening in people being displaced, not just by war, but by hunger and by famine, by environmental change. And they're all swirling around the world. And Britain, to our shame, has put out the barriers. Because actually, when I came to Britain, everybody was very kind to me. But that isn't the experience that people have now. And I'm so ashamed that it's come to this. And that's why I've come, chosen to come on and speak out now, because I think it's time that we recognise that we're all part of the same human race. And if you hurt one person, you hurt everybody. Thank you. you also, you've also said in, in previous interviews that you didn't feel like a refugee growing up in Britain in the, in the, in the 50s, I guess. I had some hard times at school, but on the whole, people were very nice to us. I, it's true, I didn't feel like a refugee. I didn't even know what a refugee was. I just thought, thought of this as my home. And when I came to write Anna's story, it, it forced me to look back at my childhood and so many things that had, um, well, that had, had been unclear at the time became more clear. I became a victim of a gang of bully boys at school. But maybe it was because I was a refugee. And maybe it was just because um, kids are horrible to each other anyway. I was never quite sure which it was. Yeah. But that was my experience at school and growing up anyway. And how did you find, because uh, you met with the person in, in question, the refugee. Yes. Um, obviously, you were not allowed, you're not allowed to, we're not allowed to share her name because of lots of legal reasons. Yes. Reasons. Um, and you had to kind of transform it um, into uh, into something which was which is kind of a public a public record. Um, well, I we think the thing that got me going was the crossover between you being a nightmare and being a lived reality. So she'd been awakened from sleep, and she wasn't sure whether she was still a nightmare or whether it was real. And I took that as my starting point. Thank you. Um, the, 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 which I did feel as a child, the incredible responsibility you have as a child for your parents and she, that she had for her younger brother. And how did she come across uh, as an adult? Because you, you met her in adulthood, in early adulthood. 
Um, she seemed confident and mature, and that she can only have gained from the, that experience. And the thing which shocked him me a bit was when I wrote it and I showed it to Anna. Um, she maybe takes some things out which refer to the detaining company because um, the, the Gatwick group are really allowed to go in there. Um, they don't have the right to go in, they just go in and, and befriend the refugees because the, um, the company allows them to. And she was afraid that if I appeared too hostile, they would be barred from visiting other people in that situation. So, so, our hands, so your hands are tied to a certain extent by this, this ongoing relationship. Um, yes, but it's fair enough in a way. Yeah, you yeah. operate in the constraints, and that's why partly why I chose the image of a nightmare. Yeah, thank you. Um, David, I, was, uh, I want to go, move on to you and talk about how, um, uh, just to carry on with what Anna was saying about how the book is used as a tool for uh, brokering conversations with politicians uh, in government and politicians across all the, the, the entire the sort of party, party political spectrum here in Britain, um, how you've gone about doing that and what the, what the kind of uh, response has been. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Thank you, Marina, for speaking so powerfully um, just now. Um, so when we, when, when we uh, started Refugee Tales, we, we were already very aware of the hostile environment that uh, the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, had yes. uh, announced as uh, an, uh, her intention for forthcoming immigration legislation. This was way back in 2012. And when we, we first walked in 2015, and as Anna said, we were calling attention to the fact that the UK is the only country in Europe that detains people indefinitely. And we were calling for that policy to end. Um, I, think, um, I think when we embarked on that first nine day walk and shared all of those tales, we thought people would be so shocked and outraged that the world might change overnight. And uh, we've learned a lot about political campaigning in the meantime, I mean, an awful lot. Um, and uh, after you and Comma Press started to, to publish the tales, the first volume came out in 2016, if I, if I remember rightly, we realized that, that we had, we had a, a really powerful uh, lobbying tool on our hands, um, that this was uh, all we really needed to do to, to make the case against indefinite detention was, to, was for the book to be taken to policymakers and for the policymakers to be told these stories in this book are the consequence of your policy of indefinite detention and that policy has to change as a matter of urgency. And um, those, those conversations um, have been ongoing. Um, they've, uh, so various people who've worked with the organization have had those conversations directly uh, with parliamentarians, um, especially people with lived experience of detention have had those uh, conversations. And I mean, the, the, the project is now six or seven years old and uh, the, the, history of, uh, the history of our kind of attempt to change policy is a kind of, you know, it's a varied one. For a long time, we were making, we felt along with other people in the sector, we were making great progress. In the last parliament, when the government had a slender majority, there were enough government MPs concerned by the violations of human rights that uh, uh, indefinite detention constitutes. There are enough government MPs of that mind that there was a real possibility that there could be a change of law, a very real possibility. Um, an, an amendment had been constructed, carefully constructed um, by, uh, by uh, campaigners and barristers that was in place. That was, uh, and that was all set to be uh, voted on and we could have anticipated voted through successfully at the end of 2019. Um, and then Boris Johnson prorogued Parliament and then he called an election um, and then the uh, parliamentary arithmetic altered. And very frustratingly, having been very, very close to what would have been a, a really kind of historic change of law, we are now in a, we now find ourselves in a different position. Um, but um, during that process, we, uh, we made the argument repeatedly, the argument was heard. And I, I think it would be true to say that because of the work of various organizations in uh, uh, campaigning around this issue, there is a much greater awareness of the fact that the UK detains people indefinitely, that it's alone in Europe in doing so. 
that that has to be uh, altered as a, as a matter of urgency. So we aren't as close as we hoped to a change of law because politics has changed, but the, the arguments are all there. And in all kinds of ways, the arguments were won. Uh, we just need now to work in different ways to kind of maintain those arguments and keep them alive. Um, we, I could say a bit more about the way these questions have internationalized, if that might be. Um, I was also, well, before we go on to yeah, yeah, sure. the wider international question, uh, I was going to ask a few questions about um, the kind of British um, kind of story. As you say, yeah. you've, you've had this, uh, uh, this, this journey over the first few years of the project in which yeah. the, the message was getting, was getting out there and, and people were being shocked by this because lots of people didn't even know and you were filling out you know, a literature festival uh, stadia in, in Hay and in Edinburgh and there was this kind of a momentum building and fantastic coverage in the media um, but at the same time there's a kind of a parallel story of the decline of uh, I don't know British political life or, um, with, uh, with Brexit in 2016 and this kind of deepening nationalism uh, this uh, deepening Kind of uh, resentment to 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 the idea of kind of international cooperation and uh, welcoming uh, welcoming, um, and you have uh, people like Nigel Farage, the leader of the UKIP party in the UK, which is uh, kind of pushed uh, the Brexit as a as a as an issue, uh, using kind of the, uh, posters uh, which and and uh, iconography which kind of mirrored. The, the Nazi iconography of the 30s, you know, about being swamped, about being overrun with migrants. Uh, they used a very famous photograph of a kind of winding trail of migrants, which uh, almost identically mirrored uh, a fascist uh, poster from the 30s about, about migrants, about, about Jewish people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what happened? What has happened to this country? Uh, I know it's a big question. Anybody? anybody yes, I've asked myself uh, that. Because sorry. The British, the, the Thai government was much more tolerant of diversity than Britain seems to be now. Um, it's a big question. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll offer a, a view. So, well, so when we started in 2015, it was when we worked, walked for the first time, it was just after the 2015 election. And we committed ourselves at the end of that walk to uh, walking for, we would, we would walk until indefinite detention had been ended, which was a risky statement and a foolhardy <laughs> statement. In some ways. And, uh, and our, we had our eyes on the 2020 election because, that, because we were living with a fixed term parliament. So we were aiming at that 2020 election. Um, there've been, as you, there's been two elections since, as you, and, there's been a, and there's been the Brexit referendum. And the kind of, there's been a kind of, uh, there's been a kind of convulsion in, in British politics as in global politics. So there's been this, there has been a terrible alteration. And we have seen, we have seen exactly, I mean, you've said it, we've seen a, in a, a rise in far right politics. And we've seen how far right politics has kind of colonized um, uh, the, the parts of the, the, the mainstream of British politics. All of this is deeply concerning. The, I, I want to bring it back, though, to detention and the part that detention has played in this, and, and also back to the, the, the kind of the analogy you're drawing with the 1930s. So um, if, you, if you were to read Hannah Arendt, for instance, who's, who's writing about that moment, she would say that um, she was saying about that earlier moment that the minute you produce these kind of non-persons, these persons occupying this kind of limbo world, then you are producing the circumstances in which um, hostility can be demonstrated and a politics of hate can, gener can be generated and people can generally be dehumanized. And so I think that, so there are, there are many, many explanations which are like sort of beyond my expertise for why there has been a, a rise in the far right. But let's not forget the fact that in 2012, the government was calling for a hostile environment against people seeking asylum. Um, and the indefinite detention of people uh, was a cornerstone of that environment. In other words, the government produced the set of circumstances in which this kind of politics of hate could develop. And so it just it, it remains all the more important that we that we we maintain this campaign and that we hold that line. We aren't we're not about we aren't right now about to achieve a change in law. 
but it's never been more important that uh, the groups like ours and writers like Marina working with groups like ours insist on human rights because they're, they are really in peril. And the consequence of not holding the line around human rights is exactly the kind of politics that you were describing just a moment ago. It's, it's, it's never been more important. That's, a, that's not a full answer, but it's an answer from the point of view of the project, I think. Thank you, David, and thank you for speaking so powerfully. Um, uh, Anna, if if you don't mind, I'd, also, I'd like to ask you uh, uh, about your own personal connection with this issue. I've worked with you uh, on and off on this project for four or five years, and I never knew uh, your personal background. I, it, it never came up because uh, your your commitment to this project has always been about this issue and these these refugees and their stories. Uh, but lo and behold, you have your own story. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your particular background uh, and, and your personal family connection to this issue of uh, the refugee condition. Yeah, of course. So, um, so my family, um, or most of them perished um, uh, in Austria uh, or from Austria um, in the Second World War. And my dad was a refugee on the kinder transport. So I, I, mean, I think everybody, you know, regardless of the nature of, of the loss in their lives, kind of um, has to find a way of processing whatever loss it is, whether it's a, a violent loss or a natural loss. Um, but I do think that um, the kind of loss that, that we had as a family um, probably means that I kind of feel I have to remember it all the time. Otherwise, my forgetting is like a second murder. I don't know, it's, it's a strange thing to say, but um, I don't think that working with refugees is, is a natural result of that. I think I could do the remembering if I was baking bread or making perfume or, you know, however, whatever my work was. Um, but for me, um, my father didn't tell me tales of the bad stuff that happened to him. He always focused on telling me about the welcome that he had when he came to the UK. He told me about someone who gave up their seat to him when he was on the train from Harwich. He told me about how people in Ireland made him welcome when he first worked on a farm there. So I always felt that welcome was a bit like a trump card, that it was a, a, a really amazing thing. So living geographically where I do, next to Gatwick, with two detention centres, I think the history just meant that I couldn't not work out what my response to that was. I had to confront it. Um, and I could have confronted it and thought, I'm too busy, I'll bake bread or make perfume. Um, but I think because this feeling of welcome was so important to me, um, that's why I started originally working in the centre that's very close to where I live. Thank you. And I guess the, the, the emphasis on walking um, is part of that, that welcome. Um, uh, because do you want to talk a little bit about why walking is so central? I mean, we both touched on it, um, but this isn't just a series of commissions. This isn't just a lobbying uh, campaign. This isn't just an awareness raising campaign. This is a walk. Why mm. is why is walking so kind of central and the, the 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 interaction with the landscape so central to this idea of welcome? Oh gosh, I mean, well, when people are released from detention, they're destitute. Um, they don't have the financial means to travel. Um, and so making people visible in the landscape feels like a huge victory. Uh, when we first started walking, we simply thought it was getting from A to B. We had no idea how transformative that process of sharing tales, walking alongside someone would be. And I have to say the conversations and the way that ideas develop and open out and transform is as important in those informal walks uh, as it is in the more formal evening sharings of the writers, the writers' tales. Um, 
but David speaks very eloquently on this. David, do you want to? I don't know if I do. That was that was that was great what you just said. Um, yeah, I mean, Anna's exactly right. The the um, the the hostile environment. It has this kind of there's this strange play of visibility and invisibility. So in one way, it's a display of hostility. In another way, it functions by keep keeping people separate and outside. It's you know let's let's name it. It's a form of segregation. The, there was um, there was a period when um, a person who had been released from detention might be entitled to a form of uh, government relief uh, in the absence of, let's say, the right to work. People can't work. And that form of relief was an Azure card, which amounts to about five pounds a day. And the Azure card could be spent on you know, only, only restricted things. And one of the things it couldn't be spent on was public transport. So people are being literally kind of kept away from um, mainstream society. So the, the, the walk makes the walk makes people visible in in a safe space, the, the space of the walk. There is a vis visibility that's achieved. But also, I mean, in a, in a really kind of straightforward way, the environment that we lived in was being called a hostile environment. The, the, the landscape that we live in was being called that. And we wanted to reclaim it for the for the language of welcome. And it's a it's in one way it's symbolic. But in another way, it's not just symbolic. We walk for quite long stretches of time. We have all of the conversations that Anna talks about. And we as a group are transformed by those conversations. And let's just believe the possibility that the landscape itself is also transformed by those conversations because we know that you know, language and landscape are so intimately connected. And we don't, we don't believe that, this, that there's, nothing, there's nothing naturally hostile about this environment. It can be, it can be transformed into a language of, into an environment of welcome if we were so minded and if we had the will to do that. And so the, 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 walk, the, walk, is, the walk is, I, I think in ways that we didn't imagine, we have become committed to the politics of walking, uh, which I think would be a whole other Zoom podcast, something like that, so. And uh, I guess we, we should also talk about uh, the pandemic and how's that, how that has affected refugees in the UK and, and, uh, and uh, further afield, but it's also affected this project because you weren't able to walk this year. So, uh, Anna, do you want to talk a little bit about how you adapted to to the to COVID? Gosh, well, um, COVID is extremely dangerous um, for migrants, um, partly because the routes open to them decrease, so they will are coming to the UK on one route, which makes them visible. Um, and as governments get more desperate at a time of COVID, so they ramp up the anti-migrant rhetoric as a tool um, to, to um, attract support. So the whole political um, landscape is very dangerous. Um, during COVID, people in detention centres were released because it was recognised that social distancing wasn't possible. Um, and so, and the sky didn't fall in when the numbers reduced. So that was a positive. Having said that, people were often re released to destitution, um, to homelessness, um, and because day centres and the kind of places where they usually interacted were closed, people suffered um, during isolation um, in an extreme way. Um, but um, Have you been able to stay in contact with uh, those people that you were working with inside the detention centres now they've been kind of temporarily released? Yeah, so our work for the first time moved from simply supporting people in detention um, to also supporting people out of detention. And the way we had to um, vary the project was that instead of walking together as a community, um, people walked wherever they were, socially distanced in their locality. Um, people took photographs of bridges, which sort of represented the fact that we were connected. Um, and we had on an online series of events um, to bring everyone together. And of course, that had the effect of opening the project up to the world. So people were walking in Australia, um, in Canada, um, in Europe, um, in solidarity. Um, and that was a really 
um, a wonderful thing. Because although we do encounter this hostile narrative from the government, we often find that when we're out walking on the ground, um, people seem almost relieved to be able to express welcome. I think that's true. I was also uh, gonna ask uh, you, David, just to talk about your work. Uh, since, uh, since the third edition of Refugee Tales, you've, had, uh, a, you've been working on a research project that's looked at how other countries around Europe and around the world have responded to the migrant crisis. And I was just wondering if you could give us a sense of um, how different countries have, have responded uh, to, quotes the migrant crisis. Um, and how, how this, the story is, in, in Europe in particular, is, is developing kind of rapidly since, since the pandemic started. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, that's a, it's a good question. And I mean, it's not, it's not a question I'm in completely equipped to answer right now, but I can, um, but what I think what's, uh, what's really important to say is that um, uh, as much as the, the UK has this, this devastating policy around uh, detention, um, for during the lifetime of the project, um, detention itself has become an increasingly prominent international question. It's become uh, it's become a default policy for all kinds of uh, for all kinds of regimes, uh, and, and you know, in particular regimes that would call themselves liberal democracies. And the default is that where you have a group of people that you don't quite know what you want to do with, you you lock them up, you detain them indefinitely at borders, um, in interiors, or whatever. And you, you know, so increasingly, you only have to uh, open, scroll through a newspaper, and the, the question of detention is right, right there in front of you. So, I mean, what, one of the things that the project wants to do, and I have to say, at this point, I have to thank Comma Press for everything it's done for the project because it has opened up to uh, opened us up to an, an international audience, and um, it's becoming increasingly clear that in order to address the question of detention, we have to understand it as an international question. Um, and this, the, the particular research project that, you, that you're, you're referencing, it uh, involves co a combination of uh, researchers and activists and people with lived experience from the US and from Canada and from Italy and from the UK. And, and we're, really, uh, we're really just kind of, it's comparative, we're comparing notes on uh, what, what the hostile environments uh, uh, amount to in those different countries. And especially we are asking the question, um, how are stories thwarted in those different countries? And what would it mean to get those stories out properly in those different countries? And the, 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 hunch, the, the hunch is this, that um, if state apparatus goes to a huge amount of effort to stop those stories being shared, which it does in all of those contexts, um, then there must be something really powerful in the stories in the first place, because otherwise, why would you do that? In other words, if you can get, if really you can get the stories out, if really people can hear the stories, then that becomes the basis for a for a kind of change. And the um, the I mean the kind of um, the, the maybe the best instance of this, and it's very pressing for us this morning. So Marina was referring earlier to the fact that, like you know, in the last couple of days, it's become clear that the UK is contemplating offshoring detention. In in the past. We have said as refugee tells things are really bad um, in the UK, but at least we're not offshoring the question as, as they do in one or two. Other. And Australia is obviously the prime example of this. And the, uh, the, writer, the, the writer everybody should read who we were lucky enough to work with this year uh, through refugee tales is Beirouz Bouchani, who, uh, who wrote a novel called No Friend But the Mountains. And his novel was written from the detention center, which he simply calls a prison at Manus Island. And it was written as a series of texts to his translator from that detention center. And uh, it tells you if, if anybody is any doubt about the need for this not to happen any more than it has already happened, read that book. Um, mm. Because the, the point simply being that the further out of view people are from, um, from legal political apparatus, the more their human rights are abused. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't absolutely follow, but in practice, it seems to follow. Um, so, uh, so this is, I think that what the Refugee Tales is increasingly saying, and what that research project is saying is, this is an international issue, and we have to, to address it, we have to understand it as such. It's going to become, and it's going to become more international. Because it's not just war or, or hardship, but Absolutely. people are from it's also environmental 
change. And and let and I completely right. And let and just go back to that moment that we were all referring to just a just a, a little while back. That that kind of mid-century moment, that kind of just after the Second World War. And you know there there was there were many difficulties with the way those operations were handled and and the displaced persons mm -hmm. camps, as far as I've read about them, were were, were very difficult places to to, uh, uh, to 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 inhabit. But remember what happened at that moment. The, the, world, the, the world's policymakers understood that there was a need for a universal declaration of human rights. They mm. understood that there was a need in 1951 for a convention relating to the status of the refugee. Compare that moment of international thinking around these questions with the kind of dereliction that we're seeing right now. And, uh, and you, you sort of understand the way we've We've fallen, fallen away, and the, the way the way we fail to step up to the question. There has, as Marina says, there has to be a moment when we start to think properly internationally about this again. I sometimes wonder whether COVID is that moment, whether COVID will do for our generation what the war did for the previous generation, and that we'll emerge kinder and more. Um, more tolerant of other people and people in different parts of the world. Well, we have to, we have to, we have to work to make it the moment, don't we? We have, to, we have to. I'm very um, heartened by the way that um, there's international cooperation on a vaccine, and also I'm disheartened by the way that some countries seem to be bent on buying up all the PPE and all the vaccine for themselves and not share, share it. I wonder. Uh, because we we're, we're all thinking, you know, exactly that, Marina. Um, you know, mm. could this be the turning point? Is have we now hit the bottom? I wonder. Will I think we haven't a... hit the bottom. I think it's yet to come. Unfortunately, we're all we're all kind of hoping and praying that that is that is the case. Mm. But um, just going back to kind of European policy and EU policy, they've had uh, this this terrible fire in Moria in Lesbos. Uh, yes. Uh, which which is kind of a, re a result of um, a, a number of things coming together the, the the pandemic obviously and also this this hotspot policy where the EU has has kind of left it to uh, the frontline countries to deal with it there and give them support but it's essentially Greece's problem and Italy's problem etc um, I wonder if there's any sign of of there's any hope in the fact that that policy has obviously collapsed and now thousands of people have been moved to, onto ships and temporary kind of refuge out uh, since, the, since that yeah. camp Moria has, has burnt to the ground. Um, is, there, is there any kind of sign of uh, a shift in, in EU policy or European thinking um, at this point? <laughs> do anyone? <laughs> do I didn't do it. Uh, so what you know, like 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 everybody or, or on, on that particular question. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose I got. I suppose we've got two connections with this. So, I mean, we uh, as as a project, we are we are beginning to work with a with a writer who was detained in the in the Moria uh, uh, refugee camp. Where so in the midst of this, and I I didn't know this. There is a detention center. Um, so so we we have a connection in that way but in other ways we're just we're just following the, the news as it emerges that does there does seem to be a, a, a recognition increasingly in europe that this kind of this fr this frontline approach this 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 first country approach is 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 hardly sustainable and there there is you know there is talk now of a kind of um an, e an equal an equal sharing in in response to the situation so um, so it is equal sharing that will not include Britain. Yes, well, that's 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 really right. Um, I mean, we we just we have to we have to be we have to be moving to a, a different kind of response, don't we? I mean, so so sometimes sometimes when we talk to people about de about detention, um, a person might say, um, "Yeah, I, it's really bad that people are detained," but think of the numbers. Um, who are moving, you know, that a person might say that and then we would carry on the discussion with them. But turn that on its head. So the, the UNHCR reported that, um, that in 2019, uh, 75 million people were, uh, were displaced one way or another uh, across the globe. And, and kind of staggeringly, and I had to like check the maths on this, but I think the maths is right. That amounts to one in 100 of us as humans, okay? 
So then you have to understand that there absolutely has to be some other way of thinking this through because displacement, forced movement, forced movement is a thing that is, is, is with us on a, on a huge scale for all the reasons that Marina has been, has been suggesting, has been indicating. Um, and we, we have to do a different kind of thinking. And those, you know, the pressure points, um, so you're talking about Moria, um, uh, but you could, obviously you could talk about Lampedusa, and now you can talk about the channel. These, these stress points will, each and every one of them, make it more necessary that a different kind of thinking will be done. I mean, we, you know, quite what a post-Brexit Britain does in response to this, I, I haven't yet fathomed. Um, uh, one thing we do know about post-Brexit Britain is that um, it will no longer be, be able to operate according to the Dublin Convention, whereby people were returned to the, 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 the place that they, the country they first arrived at. Um, so, and I don't know that the people who are thinking Brexit through were necessarily thinking that through when they wanted to secede from European regulations, but that's just a, a thing. Thank you. Yeah, so, so we want European leaders to be thinking differently, but to be honest, we want everybody to be thinking at all. Um, I mean, Moria was horrific, the fire, but it was horrific before. What happened afterwards was horrific. Um, and it just is allowed to happen because people are indifferent. And there's a kind of um, moral culpability from all of us if we're not thinking about Moria and, and addressing the issues. Exactly. One thing that, um, just to try and lift the mood, uh, <laughs> One thing that I was always amazed by when, I, when I've done little bits of volunteering uh, in Calais and uh, the, the La Berge the warehouse for refugees there and around Dunkirk and the jungle um, is the incredible volunteer effort. It's absolutely uh, just mind blowing. There are people who have traveled from all over Europe uh, to uh, commit months of their time there. There are people who go for just the weekend there are people donating um, kind of clothes and, and basics from all over uh, south, uh, southeast England, uh, going through the, uh, the Channel Tunnel every weekend. Um, it's, it's just astonishing. There are people from the, the far corners of Europe who had moved there and given their lives to, to volunteering. And <coughs> that is just, it's just totally mind blowing. I've never seen anything like it, you know, in my life. Um, and it's, 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 it's um, you know, it's cause for some optimism that, you know, some people do get it, whilst the, the majority of people are just ignoring it. And as I say, just, as you say, and I just kind of not thinking about it at all. But though, but amongst those that are thinking about it, it's huge, huge dedication um, and, and commitment. And it, sometimes, it, you know, it's not always, um, it's not always, you know, as 100% efficient or as uh, as channeled as it as it could be, or the the results aren't what everybody wants, uh, everybody intended. Uh, but there is the kind of there is a, a, a base there, um, and you must take heart from that. And the, <clears throat> another thing, I take great heart from when I wrote the story I wrote. It was the importance, the thing that made the final difference was commun community action. Mm. That makes me think of Anna, but it was the fact that they had the support of the local community that enabled this family to settle. And that was certainly the, the um, feeling about my family. And it comes across to Anna because she lives near Gatwick and she wanted to do something local. But it's terribly important. And there's, there's many stories in all of the volumes of Refugee Tales about people who were who were just lost, uh, lost yes. in this cycle of uh, detention and, and uh, re-detention. Um, and it's, um, a, you know, in a foreign country without any support, without any legal apparatus, any uh, emotional support, no family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And many of the stories talk about their kind of, their one moment of hope and their, they talk about uh, individual volunteers as like their saviors, yes. they use this word. Saviors, uh, you know, um, and um, as you say, and um, uh, uh, Marina, it is those tiny, tiny little volunteer groups, uh, mm. churches, synagogues, mosques, community groups, libraries, you know, people just uh, working in 
a really, really localized, uh, mm. atomized, you know, very, very, very kind of basic uh, grassroots way, which kind of gives them the, the, a, a turn in their own lives. Mm. I, I just want to say, I mean, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Ra, to, to, to point to reasons for optimism because we, we, it's crucial that we do and, and everything that you're saying is right. And just in, in, the, in, in the context of the project, although the stories that we share are, are difficult and, and troubling and traumatic um, for the people telling them and the people hearing them, um, the walking itself, just to go back to that, is is the is the optimistic frame of the project as a whole because you know you've just got you know you've got a 100, 150, sometimes more people walking together, sharing stories. Um, some people have experienced detention. I guess the majority have not experienced detention, but there's a kind of just a dialogue going on, and it's that 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 allows the project to continue. It's that it's that it's that community that's built through walking that has enabled the project to continue. So there are. You know, there are all kinds of reasons for optimism. Um, our 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 policymakers are nowhere near as good as our people. I would say that's what that was. That's been my inference. I think people have uh, something a more generous approach uh, in small numbers, and then they go and like these awful politicians. So people have a sort of bifurcated approach. On the one hand, they're kind and generous and good neighbours. And on the other hand, they like somebody to be nasty on their behalf. Good cop, bad cop. <laughs> the leaders as, uh, as the bad cops. Um, on this uh, subject of, of positive uh, kind of inspiration, um, I was going to ask what other kind of works of literature, because this is a in, a, in a way, this is a response to a political and social and moral crisis with literature, with writing. And I was wondering if, um, when you first came up with this idea, um, uh, Anna and, and David, was there were there any kind of precedents for this? Were were there other examples of? Uh, and this is a question to Marina as well. Are there other examples of of writers who have really changed the conversation uh, that you take hope from? Uh, in, you know, the conversation about any political issue. Well, I think in relation to Black Lives Matter one has become much more aware of black writers as a result of that. And they get a, a much wider public than they would otherwise. So that's... Yeah. I very seldom read it, but I listen to a lot of books on the Audible or on BBC. And I noticed that the BBC had done quite a series and I was trying to listen to them and I learned from them. Because it, somehow it seems almost inconceivable that the BBC would have done that before Black Lives Matter. And it's now we take it for granted. Like the present book, book a shortlist is so diverse. Um, and it's the first time for years that it's been like the, the ones being given other stories to read. Thank you. Oh. Thanks. Um, I suppose um, that if, I, if I was to offer a couple of I mean, one, so one writer who's a touchstone for me around all, all kinds of questions like this is Arundhati Roy. Um, yes. So, you know, a, a wonderful novelist, but then commits, I don't know how many years of her life uh, after the, the God of Small Things to writing political journalism, which is, which is itself a kind of sharing of stories and absolutely committed constantly to sharing those stories that uh, that uh, governments and, and officialdom would would like to keep out of view, she seems um uh, she she seems a, a, a completely exemplary in in that work. Um, and uh, just um, leading on from what Marina was saying, there's a really wonderful book of poetry, which is really a book of prose called Citizen by Claudia Rankin, which is right out of the Black Lives Matter movement, oh. which, which just does a kind of a really powerful documenting of uh, mm. of the kind of aggressions that people are, are, are the uh, wrong end of. So there's a couple of instances. Thank you. Thank and you. and just, just the hopeful, on the hopeful tone, uh, just to mention our patron, Ali Smith, whose quartet um, looks at detention head on um, and whose uh, final novel really ends with a note of hope. Thank you. Um, I guess just to to um, to end this uh, this uh, 
fascinating conversation. I would like to ask you, David, to read a uh, prologue because the, you wrote uh, the prologue to the very first uh, edition uh, of Refugee Tales. And uh, as, as you say, it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a positive way, it's a positive point at which uh, for, us, uh, for us to end uh, a, a beginning, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So would you, would you mind reading that? Thank you, Ra. So, prologue. This prologue is not a poem, it is an act of welcome. It announces that people present reject the terms of a debate that criminalizes human movement. It is a declaration this night in Shepherd's Well of solidarity. It says that we have started, that we are starting out, that by the oldest action, which is listening to tales that other people tell of others, told by others, we set out to make a language that opens politics, establishes belonging, where a person dwells where they are now, which is to say where we are now, walking in solidarity along an ancient track, that we come back to the geography of it, north of Dover, that where the language starts, now long and folk to go and on this pilgrimage. In June, not April, and with the sweet showers far behind us, through with birds singing and people sleeping with open eye, and what we long for is to hear each other's tales and to tell them again, as told by some hath holpen, walking so pricketh him nature not believing the stories our officials tell because we know too much about what goes unsaid and what we choose to walk for is the possibility of trust in language to hear the unsaid spoken and then repeated made unambiguous and loud set out over a landscape gathered step by step as by virtue of walking which we call our commons every sap vessel bathed in moisture and what that commons calls for is what these stories sound of crossing for to seek and strange strands in moments of emergency one that they were seek of tribunals when the unsaid goes unspoken lines of questioning no official has written down people present by video answered mis answers mistranslated as outside by the station at the dead of morning as the young sun rises woken in their homes people are picked up and detained routinely and arbitrarily in every halt and heath under the sun while small fowls make a melody and why we walk is to make a spectacle of welcome this political carnival across the weald of kent people circulating making music listening to stories people urgently need said and said and said again stories of the new geography stories of arrival of unaccompanied minors of people picked up and detained of process and mistranslation networks of visitors and friends this new language we ask for forming strung out along the, the north downs way which makes it a question of scale consider just the scale of the undertaking chaucer's pilgrims crossing palatai and turkey and rus across the great sea which is the mediterranean dark these days not like wine crossing through flanders through artois crossing the water at picardy and all the while finding stories and then all of them gathering one night in london and so the host says since we're walking why don't we tell each other tales and so they do out of southwark and what comes out of southwark is a whole new language of travel and assembly and curiosity and welcome to make his english sweet that's why Chaucer told his tales, how badly we need English to be made sweet again, rendered hostile by act of law, so that even friendship is barely possible. There, as this Lord was keeper of the cell, so we might actually talk, and in talking, come to understand the journey. Tender, says the poet, to Canterbury they went. Tender, to hold, from the French, Tendre from the English for listening to a story as it is said to attend Tendre and then writing it down because it isn't written because the hearings in the British immigration system are not courts of record so there are no stories and people leave as if there never had been stories and so nobody who reaches a verdict has a real story with which to contend so now we are telling them on mass and people will listen in sundry lands and especially from every shire's end. But this prologue is not a poem. It is an act of introduction, bathed every vein in such liqueur, and all the introduction can do is set the tone, albeit the tone is everything, and the tone is welcoming, and the tone is celebratory, and the tone is courteous, and the tone is real. And every step 
sets out a demand and every demand is urgent. And what we call for is an end to this inhuman discourse. And so we stop this night and the host steps up and he says, listen to this story. Wan, that April with his Shura's suit and the room goes quiet and a voice starts up and then the language alters, sweet, tender, pear said to the root. Thank you, David. Uh, it just remains for me to thank everybody uh, for this amazing event and, and conversation. Um, thank you to Roman Simic uh, and Petra from uh, the festival. Uh, thank you for the organizers of uh, Rieka 2020, uh, the Arts Council England, uh, and obviously Gatwick Detainees, uh, Gatwick Detainees Welfare Group, uh, Kent Refugee Help. If you would like to listen to these stories uh, and watch them being read by uh, a selection of famous uh, British actors, please go to uh, 28for28.org. Um, it's a series of videos that have been put together by um, uh, an amazing uh, list of, of actors, including uh, Jeremy Irons, Christopher Eccleston, uh, Zoe Wanamaker, um, uh, Maxine Peake, and many, many others. Um, and also, please go to refugeetales.org uh, for more information for these books. But for now, please enjoy the rest of the festival, and thank you for tuning in today.